Welcome to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I'm your host, certified religious transition and trauma recovery coach, Terry Hales. I help people step out of the shadows of religious fear and shame and embrace their authentic selves with love and empathy. If you're ready to throw off the shackles of learned binary thinking and explore a more nuanced approach to life, this is your playground. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. So we're going to kind of do a take two, I guess, this week. Last week, I had recorded a whole podcast on relationships with emotionally immature loved ones. And because we had been talking all about, you know, different kinds of narcissism, and we had even talked about organizational narcissism, Many of us who come from high demand religion, we have parents or siblings or grandparents or even friends or spouses or children, and sometimes even ourselves, right, who have these pieces of emotional immaturity inside of us, and it can make it really difficult for us to have deep, healthy, trusting relationships because we just haven't learned the skills to do that. And it can be really frustrating for those of us who are beginning to become self-aware, are learning some emotional maturity skills, are learning how to relate with others in ways that are healthy. And sometimes we have people in our lives that maybe aren't doing those same things. And we live in a culture that's like, if they're not healthy, cancel them. And maybe there are people in your life you don't want to cancel. And but you also don't want to go crazy. You don't want to continue to have to deal with things that feel abusive or harmful or just, you know, throw you off emotionally for days or weeks on end. And so today's podcast, the one I was supposed to record last week but had technical difficulties um, while I was on vacation, we're going to redo it. So I'm going to re-record that podcast because I think it's really important for us to have these tools and this understanding in our tool belt. It gives us options to decide what we want to do with our relationships with emotionally immature loved ones. Now, we have been talking a lot about narcissistic personality disorder, and really, narcissism is an extreme form of emotional immaturity. So if you're diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder, it's, you know, on the spectrum of emotional maturity, it's kind of far on that extreme side of emotional immaturity. And on the far, far end of emotional immaturity, you would find people with things like malignant narcissism, which we haven't really dug into, but malignant narcissism is not only where they display traits of grandiosity and entitlement and an excessive need for attention and praise or a need to control their environment and a lack of empathy, but that's also mixed with like antisocial, sadistic, and even paranoid behaviors. So it's kind of sociopathy and antisocialism mixed in with narcissism. And what this means is on that really, really, really far side of emotional immaturity, it means that people aren't just self-absorbed and oblivious that they're hurting you but they're hurting you and dehumanizing you on purpose, and it often brings them pleasure. Now, today's episode is not talking about that super extreme end. I swear every time I talk about narcissistic personality disorder, I will get at least a couple of messages saying, you know, you talk really empathically about people with narcissistic personality disorder, or you, you know, talk about having compassion and empathy But what if, and someone always brings up a malignant narcissist that like purposefully destroys someone else's life because it makes them feel more powerful, it brings them a sense of joy, it makes them feel, um, I don't know, more in control. And I'm not talking about people who are, you know, planning out the demise of others in a sociopathic 
or psychotic way. I am not talking about those people. What I am talking about today is the many people that fall in the middle of the spectrum. And for those of us who come from high demand religion, almost everyone you know is going to be somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. Many of us were taught to be emotionally immature because in high demand religion, we are encouraged to be disconnected emotionally, meaning that there were some emotions typically that were not okay to feel or only some people were allowed to feel those emotions. For many of us, those are things like anger, jealousy, grief sometimes, or sadness. Fear is another one that comes up really often. So some of us were not even allowed to experience joy or a sense of pride in a job well done. So when there are certain emotions that are not okay to feel in a family or an organization or in a relationship, it's going to create a sense of emotional immaturity. And for many of us, this is generational trauma. It's not just that our parents woke up and are like, you know what? I really think I would like to create dysfunction inside of my children. I have emotionally mature tools, but I'm just not going to pass those down to my kids. Often what has happened is for generations, our parents raised us in an emotionally immature way because they were raised in an emotionally immature way and so on and so forth down through the generations. So we are chain breakers here. Please know that today while we're talking, we are not talking about people who are hurting you maliciously. We are talking about people typically who are in the middle somewhere who are not self-aware because they were taught to distrust themselves and to listen to authority instead of their own inner compass. They were encouraged not to have boundaries. They were told it was mean to have boundaries or rude. And often these people were encouraged to be perfectionistic they had unrealistic high expectations of them and a fear of judgment for making mistakes or falling short of expectations. And they passed those things on to us because they were not connected to themselves. It wasn't okay to feel and to have needs and to communicate those things. And so they didn't ever develop those skills. And so they weren't able to pass on those skills. So if you have people like that in your life, even if they have a lot of narcissistic traits, Often they have a lot of narcissistic traits because they never develop this tool set in order to listen to their own experience, process their own emotions, and communicate those to other people so that they could get their needs met in a healthy way. And they developed very unhealthy patterns to get their needs met. So we are talking about people who were never educated about how to handle their emotions. And my guess is, if you're like me, if you're middle-aged, you fall into this category too. I mean, we're talking 10 years ago, I opened up my emotional toolbox and I had two tools in there. One of my tools was to stuff everything and pretend like everything was okay to be toxically positive and just to, you know, put on my happy face, put on my mask. And the other one was like, when that didn't work, I would explode in like this really dysregulated way of like emotion everywhere. I'm actually reading a book right now. It's a murder mystery book and there's glitter bombs that go off. And that's what it felt like. It felt like I would pressure cook all of my emotions and then this bomb would go off and emotions would just like go everywhere and stick to everything. And it was uncontrollable and it was messy and it felt like it took days, if not weeks, to clean up that mess with all the people that were affected by this dysregulated emotion that would just go flying everywhere, whether it was like anger or fear or shame. A lot of times it was shame that flew out of the box. Um, resentment, uh, just all kinds of things, overwhelm, anxiety, like all of it, just everywhere. So this is who we're dealing with. We're dealing with people like I was, you know, 12 years ago, doing my best. I wanted to love people. I wanted to have intimate relationships with people. I wanted to feel safe with people. And I just didn't know how. I was doing my best with the two tools I had. And, 
you know, I, I, maybe I had a third tool in there, codependency or people pleasing, like just trying to be as perfect as possible and to meet people's needs as much as possible, hoping that they would somehow divine or intuit my needs and meet those needs because I didn't even know what my needs were. I was so disconnected from myself. I did not know what I needed. And so, I mean, that's what was in my toolbox. And I was raising kids with that toolbox. I was in a marriage with that toolbox. I was trying to, you know, navigate relationships with my parents and with friends and with siblings from that very limited toolbox. And since then, as I've come to understand what my emotions are, like I'm adding more and more and more tools, which is allowing me to have a better relationship with myself, to better communicate my needs to others, to hold myself through other people's disappointment or hurt feelings so that I can tolerate them being angry or disappointed or feeling resentful or whatever else they feel. And I'm able to start creating the safe space where I can have these close relationships with others. So if this sounds like something you want, if you're in that place where I was 12 years ago, where, you know, you have this very limited toolbox and it's just not working the way you would like it to, Or if you find yourself even in the place where I'm at right now, where I have a lot of tools that I can use with myself, and actually my tools work really well with other emotionally intelligent people who are doing their work, but you still have people who maybe aren't aware that there are more tools out there or are scared to look into more tools because they're afraid of what they'll find if they start digging in emotionally and doing their own work, or they just have so many protective measures, like they believe that they have no problems, like that narcissistic, I'm perfect, there's nothing wrong with me, everyone else is the problem sort of a thing that goes on. If you have someone like that in your life that you want to keep contact with, and you would like to have a relationship that doesn't drive you at least as crazy, keep listening. We're going to be talking specifically about having relationships with emotionally immature parents because a lot of the information I'm pulling from today is coming from a book called Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents, How to Heal from Distant, Rejecting, or Self-Involved Parents by Lindsay C. Gibson, who has a doctorate of psychology. And this book is fantastic. It's not comprehensive, but it gave me so many tools in my toolbox, helped me understand so much about what was going on in my family of origin, in the family I had created, and how I could start healing myself so that I could create healthier spaces for myself. We'll also be pulling from psychologist Katie Morton. She has several videos on YouTube. I'll link some of those in the show notes. But also from Brian Peck and Laura Anderson's work at the Religious Trauma Institute, um, they often talk about religious, I'm sorry, adverse religious experiences and like how that creates emotional immaturity. They talk about that really well. Now, before we go any further in the episode, I have one quick favor to ask of you. If you feel this podcast is helping you understand and accept yourself better, and if you feel these resources should be amplified so that more people have access to them as they deconstruct high demand religion and family trauma, please Share your favorite episode with a family member or friend who is open to support. Healing religious and family trauma becomes so much more doable when we have language to wrap around our experience, a community that understands us, and tools to help us process what we're going through. Each week, I get messages from dozens of you saying how much easier this has made your journey towards emotional and mental health. I would love, love, love to see that number rise into the hundreds and then into the thousands and beyond. Imagine what a generation of emotionally mature and healing people could accomplish together. If you think of someone specifically as you listen to this episode or any other episode on this podcast, please pause and send them a link after asking them for consent, of course. So quick overview, we have just spent several episodes talking about extreme emotional immaturity. We have talked about all different varieties of narcissism and those traits. I just really want to boil this down for us really quick so that we have this in our head so you don't have to go back and listen to several episodes. So emotionally immature people are self-centered. They tend to think of themselves first 
and often solely. Things come from their point of view and their point of view only. They have a really hard time putting themselves into someone else's shoes and looking at an interaction from someone else's viewpoint. The second thing, they either sweep conflict under the rug or they pretend it never happened or they blame everyone but themselves for what has happened. So they're conflict avoidant. So this means they either pretend that the conflict isn't there or after the conflict has happened, they pretend like everything's normal and they never address it or they blame everyone else for the conflict. They're never the problem. Everyone else is. The third thing that emotionally immature people often have in common is they're unable to take the perspective of others, which we kind of talked about in the the first one, that self-centeredness and the inability to take the perspective of others really goes hand in hand. So because they're unable to look at an interaction from someone else's point of view or understand that someone might have a different point of view, it's really hard for them to empathize. And that means that they often don't show guilt or remorse for their hurtful actions and words. The next thing is they rarely engage in self-reflection or emotional work. For many people who are emotionally immature, it's kind of like that hoarder's house that we've talked about before when you've stuffed lots of emotions over several decades. Sometimes starting to do the emotional work can feel really scary and overwhelming because there's so much stuffed inside of us. And so asking someone who is in their 60s or 70s or 80s, for instance, to begin doing emotional work for many people who've lived that long and have stuffed that many emotions, sometimes it just feels too scary and they would rather live in this kind of never, never land of you know, nothing's wrong. There's, I'm not going to deal with reality. I'm not going to unpack everything. I'm just going to continue living this way because I only have another couple of decades to live and I'll just, you know, I've dealt with it this long. I'll just deal with it a little bit longer. So you may have parents that are just like, no, it's, it feels too overwhelming. It feels too scary. It feels, um, I'm afraid. A lot of times there's shame. I'm afraid if I go and look at what I need to unpack, that it's going to unpack even more problems and I'll have even more things to be ashamed about. And remember, shame feels like life or death. When you feel like you are unworthy, when you feel like you are unlovable, unacceptable, it feels like life or death because of that genetic piece that we have in us that is tribal, that needs to belong, that needs to feel like we fit, right? So we're afraid that if we look too closely at ourselves, we'll figure out that we don't fit, that we're not lovable, that those messages we're trying so hard to suppress are actually true. And if we look too closely at our history, at our trauma, at the the things that we think and feel, that we're going to affirm that shame. So that shame keeps us silent. It keeps us from doing the work. And sometimes we have parents that are so wrapped in shame that they will subconsciously or consciously avoid the work in order to protect themselves. Because remember, our brain's number one goal is to protect us. It's to keep us alive. And if it believes that doing our own emotional work is going to bring up a lot of shame and that feels like life or death, it will keep us from doing that work. All right, another thing that emotionally immature people have in common is they expect you to be their caretaker emotionally and sometimes physically. So you'll often feel like this person wants you to set aside your own needs and put theirs first, like a parent of a small child might. So you may feel like you are caretaking a small child. It may feel like you have another child to take care of. Um, This might And it may feel like if you express your own needs, that there may be this sense of entitlement of, no, my needs come first. You have to take care of me. And there may even be some jealousy that you're taking care of your own needs or that you're doing something for yourself. Emotionally immature people are often attention seeking. They need constant attention, praise, or validation. And if they don't get it, they often throw a fit or they may use shame or guilt on you to say you're not doing enough. Now, all of us need attention and validation. It's a human need. We all need attention. We all need validation. We need to belong. We need to feel safe. But really, the I guess the big identifier here 
is if you have a person in your life that needs you to constantly feed them attention, validation, and praise, and if you don't, they turn on you or they begin to guilt you or shame you, whether it is overtly or covertly. Remember, whether it's you know very obvious that they're shaming you or whether it's more passive aggressive, that's a big sign that you're dealing with a person who is emotionally immature. They don't have the ability to come to you or they haven't developed, I should say, the ability to recognize, I need attention. I really need some validation. And then to be able to come to you without manipulating you and just say, hey, I could really use some validation right now. I'm feeling really insecure. Do you have the time and space to just like sit with me for a moment and help me process this? That's healthy. That's taking ownership, but also asking for support. That is an interdependent relationship. I think sometimes in our society, we think that it's one or the other. And Kevin and I are going to be talking about this next week. We're going to be talking about the difference between codependency, extreme independence, and then healthy interdependence, which is what we're looking for. A lot of us have been taught to see any kind of dependence as codependence, and it's just not true. We need each other. We're wired to connect, and we also need to keep an autonomous sense of self. There needs to be both. It's a balance between these two like different ideas, and we're going to talk about that next week. But an emotionally healthy person, an emotionally mature person would be able to say, I really need attention right now. And to be able to go to a trusted loved one and say, hey, I'm really feeling lonely right now, or I'm really feeling a lot of shame right now, and I'm trying to work through that. Do you have time or space to spend with me and help me work through this? Or, you know, I'm feeling like I just need touch right now. I need someone to wrap their arms around me and just like, let me feel safe for a minute. Can you do that for me? Like asking for consent, noticing what our needs are, realizing what we need to meet those needs, and then being able to communicate it to another human is a huge part of emotional maturity and asking for their consent and understanding that there may be people sometimes, like there's sometimes my husband is getting ready for a call or he's about to go to work and he can't meet my emotional needs. And that's okay. He's allowed to say, I really wish I could, but I am literally headed out the door in five minutes. I need to make my water bottle. I need to do these things. Um, I could talk to you tonight. That's what I could offer you. Or I have a list of other people who can also meet my needs. I could call my sister. I could talk to my therapist. I could, there's so many different things I could do to meet my emotional needs. I could journal and try to meet my needs myself. So there's lots of things I can do to get those needs met. Codependency is when there is a person that must meet those needs and we're dependent fully on them for that validation. Um, Interdependence is recognizing there are people I can turn to and I can ask for their consent and, you know, I can get my needs met in many different ways, but I'm in charge of making sure that those needs get met. So maybe I talk about that later tonight when Kevin's available Or maybe I call my sister if it's more urgent, or maybe I call my therapist. It just depends on what the issue is. So I just wanted to bring that up that it's not bad to need attention. We all have needs. We are wired to connect. When we're emotionally immature is when we're expecting someone else to drop everything always to meet our needs, no matter what their needs are and no matter what their capacity is. And if they can't, then we guilt, shame, blame them. We, you know, throw a big tantrum. We get passive aggressive with them. We withdraw to punish them. That's when we're getting into the emotionally immature place. All right. The next thing that emotionally immature people have in common is their other relationships tend to be distant and cold or emotionally tumultuous. So attachment tends to be a real problem for emotionally immature people. And it can be even a problem for people who are healing from emotional immaturity, who are learning the tools to become emotionally mature. So, you know, looking at other relationships, do they tend to be tumultuous? Do they tend to be codependent? Do they tend to be distant or cold? Does there tend to be this kind of underlying resentment under everything? How is that going for them? Another one, fragility. 
So super sensitive to anything hurtful said and done to them, whether it's real or imagined, but they're completely oblivious to things that they may do to hurt others. So they may even blame you for their hurtful behavior towards you, and they expect you to either pretend the hurt didn't happen or apologize for the whole situation. So fragility is a huge indicator of emotional immaturity. Are you allowed to talk about hurt with them? Or do they blow up? Do they get mean? Do they get hostile? Do they start like melting into a puddle of their own shame? Like if you bring up something that happened that hurt you, do they start bringing up all the ways that you've hurt them? Do they start talking about what a bad person they are and how terrible of a mother they are or whatever so that you have to caretake and stroke their ego and build them up and you never actually get to talk about your issue? Do they um, change the subject? That's another thing that can happen. Do they get defensive? There's all these different things that can happen. But if they're very fragile, if they're really sensitive, anytime you bring up a difficult emotion, specifically if you're bringing up something difficult that involves conflict resolution, if having conflict resolution conversations with this person is incredibly difficult because they get very defensive or fragile or they start feeling like guilty and shame and kind of spiraling and you end up caretaking them, reassuring them that they're not a terrible person, but you never really get to your issue, that's a problem. Another trait that emotionally immature people often have in common is they have a history of denying reality. So they'll either say that their felt reality is the only reality they'll accept, even if facts prove otherwise. And I know a lot of us coming from like backgrounds of adverse religious experiences and religious trauma, we have a lot of people like this, right? Like, well, that was not my experience at church. Or that was not my experience with whatever. And their experience seems to be the only one that matters. And so they might say that that's the only reality, even if you like show them facts. So I know like early on in my deconstruction journey, I was trying to share my feelings and get vulnerable with my family members and friends and particularly my family members. And they would say things like that. Well, I haven't experienced that. Well, it's not like that in my ward. Well, I didn't blah, blah, blah. And when I would try to show facts to them to be like, actually, here's what the founders of our church said, or like, here's a talk from our past general conference, like, look at all of this, like, this is what the words are actually saying, it still wouldn't change their sense of reality. Their reality was still the only correct reality. No matter what kind of proof I brought to the table and I would get so hurt and angry and frustrated and worked up and um, I became really scary myself. So maybe you're experiencing that as well, where there's like a history of denying certain realities. Um, or there are some instances where you may have family members that make up alternate realities in order to deal with the situation. So you may have family members where, you know, maybe all of your family vacations were total disasters where your parent became completely emotionally dysregulated because they were packing and the extra overwhelm and anxiety or whatever. But their memory is like the two or three times when you were having a ton of fun on the vacation and they only remember what was wonderful about the vacation or what was wonderful about these experiences growing up, but they don't remember. They've rewritten the reality that they used to freak out, scream, throw things, whatever, before you left on vacation. Or like same with church. I know that I've had clients that have talked about, you know, parents talking about how wonderful going to church was and the sun was shining and the birds were singing and all the kids were dressed perfectly and they were perfectly behaved. When in reality, it was a tug of war getting everybody ready for church and there was screaming all the way up until they got to church. And then, you know, there was a stern talking to in the car before they all plastered on their smiles and then walked in the door and sat quietly in their pew. So, you know, you may have family members that kind of rewrite history or their imagined history is or their perspective of history is the only quote unquote right history. And then the last indicator of emotionally immature people is they often hold grudges. So whenever you're engaging in conflict resolution, often these are the people that bring up things that you did, small infractions or even big infractions that you felt like you had already worked through, but they're bringing them up 
years later, sometimes decades later. So those never fully get forgiven. It's kind of a trump card whenever you want to bring up something that they've done wrong. So they often hold grudges. Um, They don't get over them quickly. They might look like on the outside, like they might have the surface veneer of everything's fine. Again, remember, we don't talk about things. If there's conflict, that's one of the things we can do is we might sweep it under the rug. We might pretend like nothing happened. But underneath, there's like this grudge that's being held. So this is something that's common to a lot of emotionally immature people. There's often a lot of grudges and like unresolved conflicts. Because think about it. If you're too fragile to have conflict resolution conversations, if you don't have the tools to recognize and care for your own emotions, are you ever going to resolve your resentments? You're not. Are you ever going to resolve your hurt feelings? You're not. So of course you're going to have grudges years down the road. It's not because you have a hard time forgiving. It's because you've never done the conflict resolution to forgive in the first place. Forgiveness, like real forgiveness, isn't a free meal ticket. Real forgiveness requires some accountability. It requires some change. Otherwise, we just keep getting hurt in the same ways. And that resentment comes back up along with all the baggage from the past because that's how our neural pathways work. Our subconscious is like, oh, yeah, I know. I know about this hurt. Remember, you got hurt like this back in 1984. You got hurt like this back in 1993. And remember, you were hurt just like this like four years ago too. So it's bringing up all of that to tell you how to react in this situation. It is connecting all of the dots for you. So of course, if you have unresolved hurt, if you have no ability to resolve conflict, then the next time something happens that reminds you of those hurts, all of that's going to come back up to mind because it's all unresolved. So we will talk more about conflict resolution at some point too. It's something Kevin and I talk about, I feel like, all of the time with ourselves, with our kids, with our friends, you know, just I feel like I talk about it a lot on Instagram as well. Having healthy relationships really does require a lot of conflict resolution skills or otherwise we find ourselves in these like dances that we create with people because we're never really resolving anything. We're either sweeping it under the rug or we're pushing off blame on someone else. And so we get into these dances where we just keep triggering each other because we never actually resolve the underlying conflict because we're unaware of what it is because we haven't developed the skills to sit with our emotions, recognize what they are, communicate them to other people so that we can then get our needs met. So conflict resolution is a huge piece to really getting those healthy relationships we want. But we cannot have conflict resolution if we have not developed the tools that we need and the skills that we need to be emotionally mature. All right. Well, Now that we understand what emotionally immature people kind of all have in common, and I have a feeling you probably have people in mind that are coming up. It might be a parent, it might be a a sibling, it might be a spouse, it might be a child, but you have something that is coming up and you're like, yeah, this person is a lot like this. And you may see yourself in this too. The cool thing is, is emotional immaturity isn't like a trait you were born with. Emotional maturity is literally a skill set that you learn. So if you're recognizing yourself in a lot of that list, I certainly did 12 years ago. I am still working on some of these things. I want you to know it does not make you a bad person. You're going to hear me say that all the time. It does not make you a bad person. It just makes you somebody who was not taught how to sit with your emotions. You were not given safe space to recognize your emotions, to be able to label them, to be able to explore them in a safe space. You would have needed an adult to sit down with you and say, hey, so it looks like you're feeling anger right now. Does that feel right? So that you could learn to label your emotions. And they might have said to you, I bet right now you feel really hot inside and your heart is beating really fast and maybe you might want to punch something. And you're describing to them physiologically what their body is doing. This is what an emotionally healthy parent would do with their children to teach them emotional maturity. They would help them label, like recognize you're feeling something in your body. 
I can see it on your face. Right now, it looks like you're feeling anger. And the child would have the freedom to be like, no, I'm not angry. I'm frustrated or I'm, you know, I'm mad. They could even use a different term for anger and you would accept that. Okay, so you feel mad. I can see that. I see your fists balled up at your side. Your face is red. Your teeth are gritted. I bet your heart's beating really fast right now too. And they would be able to respond. Yeah, I do. Like, I just want to hit or I want to kick or I want to, I just want to scream. Or we'd be able to say, yeah, I can see that. What happened that made this mad feeling start growing inside of you? And they would learn how to then go back, trace that emotion back to what happened that triggered the angry feeling. And we get to sit there and explore that. You know, Johnny took my swing at the playground or, um, you know, Kyla said she didn't want to be friends with me anymore or my brother scribbled on my drawing. Whatever it is, we'd be able to say, oh my gosh, yeah, I can see why that would make you angry. Help me understand from your perspective, why did that make you so angry? And we can ask curiosity questions and we can help them explore that. And then guess what happens? Then we get to explore what they need to feel safer, to feel more empowered, to feel better, to get their, like, what do they need? What do they want? Where are their boundaries? Especially with anger, so often it's communicating boundaries. Don't touch my drawing. It's not yours. Ask me before you draw on my paper. The anger that came with Kyla saying, I don't want to be your friend anymore. That's part of grief. That makes me feel angry and unsafe in our relationship that you could just out of the blue say, I don't want to be friends anymore. And you get to explore this. But it requires an emotionally mature parent with a full toolbox to give those tools and skills to their children. And so many of us, I would say the vast majority of us, were not raised by emotionally mature parents. The cool thing is, though, is we can always intern with someone else. We can even teach ourselves. We live in a wonderful age where you can Google or YouTube anything. You can teach yourself how to fix a car. You can teach yourself how to build countertops, how to can jam, you can also teach yourself how to develop the tools and the skill set to become emotionally mature. So you are not stuck like this forever. You were not born this way. It may feel like you were born this way because you may be in a family with parents who have the same skill set and the same patterns as you, and all your siblings might have the same patterns. And if you came from high demand religion, maybe everyone you know has those same patterns. But it's because those patterns were passed down not because you were born with them. This is a skill just like learning mathematics, just like learning to read, just like learning to write. It's a skill set you can develop. And the more you practice it, the easier it becomes. When I very first started trying to hear my emotions, to validate them, and to listen to what they needed, it was so difficult. Sometimes I wouldn't catch my emotions until days after they happened. But gradually it's gotten easier and easier and easier to the point where sometimes I can catch the emotion before I even engage in a behavior. Like I can feel it welling up inside of me. And sometimes in some of my more triggered moments, I will actually catch myself in the middle, you know, depending on which relationship I'm in. I have some relationships where we've developed much healthier patterns and it's a give and take between the both of us. But I have other relationships where, you know, maybe we're a little unevenly matched as far as emotional maturity goes, or I just, you know, we have a whole history and I can be triggered and sent right back into being 10 years old again. I can actually catch myself either in the moment or shortly after the moment and say, I'm sorry, like, let me stop. Let me rewind. That was not okay. I apologize and I can be accountable and I can say, yeah, that was the old Terry. Like, let me rewind and actually use my grown up tools um, and try again. So, and that's the cool thing with emotional maturity is because it's a skill set, you get to practice over and over again. We can always come back and say, hey, I really messed that one up. I messed that one up. 
I did not use my tools. I'm so sorry. We can be accountable and we can say, can we try that again? And we can practice and we can take breaks and we can come back and practice some more until we feel like we're getting to a healthier place. Now, I want to talk about some hard truths really quick because I think these are really important before we get into how to deal with a relationship with someone who is emotionally immature. So let's talk about these two hard truths because I think it's important for those of us who are doing our work and are willing to be self-aware and want to have healthy relationships. This is really important for us to hear. And the first one is One person cannot do all the work in a relationship. Many of us grew up in codependent relationships where we were expected to emotionally caretake the other person. Now, we can share what we've learned with someone else, but we can't actually do the emotional work for them. We can create safe space Almost like what we were talking about with a parent guiding their child and teaching them the skills. We can do that with willing participants in our life. So my husband did that with me. My husband developed emotional maturity tools. He learned how to use them before I did. Because he was getting his master's degree, becoming a therapist, and he was practicing these skills, you know, for multiple hours a day with couples in his therapy room, and I was not, I was at home homeschooling kids and taking wedding photos, he shared the tools with me. He asked my consent first and then shared the tools with me. You know, he'd ask me things like, how did that feel like it went for you? And I'd be able to be like, that was terrible. I hate that. And he'd be like, would you like me to share something with you that might make it easier in the future? And I would say, yeah, that would be great. And so then we'd sit down and he would share tools with me and he created safe spaces for me to practice using the tools. You know, when I was getting really frustrated, he would help me say like, you know, it seems like you're mad. Does that feel accurate? And I would be able to say, no, right now I just feel really overwhelmed and I'm so pissed that I'm overwhelmed. And he'd be like, okay, like we're getting someplace. So you're pissed off because you're overwhelmed. Like, who are you pissed off at? Or what are you pissed off at? And I'd have a chance to like really start to explore. So I was the one doing the introspection. I was the one willing to look at myself, but he was almost providing a framework for me to learn how to use the skills. That is not codependency because I'm doing my work. He's just teaching me how to use the tool. He was not trying to step in and smooth over my emotions and like do the emotional work for me. He was just giving me a framework and kind of like a guidebook on how to use the tools. And the better I got at using the tools, now like we're equal partners in that way. I can use my tools without him having to guide me. I would say, you know, 95% of the time, 98% of the time even. There are times where I get triggered and I, like I said, I regress. I go back to like a place where I have unhealed trauma. That does happen sometimes. So sometimes we'll get triggered And it will remind us of something that happened when we were much younger before we had the tools. And sometimes we regress and we either catch ourselves in the middle or we catch ourselves after. And when I'm with Kevin, Kevin will actually help me catch myself sooner and give me safe space to like pause and slow down and figure out what's going on. I also do that with him though, because he also has some childhood trauma and he also can regress sometimes. I find that I'm more likely to regress when I'm around my family of origin. You might find that to be true for you as well. So when I'm around my family of origin, I'm actually just more aware that I might be triggered, that I might regress. You know, I might need to slow things down. So I actually body scan a lot more around my family of origin for that reason. So, and same for Kevin, he has a tendency to go back to old patterns when he is around his family of origin, simply because like there's expectations, like unspoken subconscious expectations of what everyone's role is and how everyone acts in certain situations. And it takes some time to kind of do the work for ourselves so that we're not showing up in that same way. Every year it gets better and better, but it does still happen. I do still regress sometimes, but it's important to know that one person cannot do all the work. 
both people have to be willing to be self-aware, to do their own emotional labor, and to extend empathy to one another, or the relationship either won't get off the ground. So if you're trying to create a new relationship with somebody who's not willing to do these things, and you're doing your own work, it's not going to be a good fit. Like you're just to use a term from religion, you're unequally yoked. Like it's it's not going to work really well. Um, one or both of you are going to get really frustrated. And then it'll either do that or you're going to have an unbalanced and unhealthy power dynamic. So meaning like you're going to become kind of codependent where one person is just kind of doing all the emotional labor and one person is just always trying to like caretake the other person and manipulate and control the whole environment to keep the other person from being triggered or having an outburst. So having healthy, intimate relationships can never be one-sided. It has to be two-sided. It is a give and take, and both people have to take responsibility. This does not mean that both people have to be equally skilled with their tools. I was just telling you about how Kevin, you know, sort of progressed with his emotional maturity before I did, a couple of years before I did. And so I was willing to learn though. I was willing to do my part. It's not like he was learning all of these tools and I was like, no, I'm gonna keep doing what I've always done. I don't like it. It it wasn't like that. He came home and he was like, I've learned new things. And we were constantly talking about it. He got better at using those tools quicker than I did because he was practicing them day in and day out in his therapy room. I, on the other hand, was here at home with toddlers, but I was also in a situation where I couldn't practice the tools maybe nearly as much as Kevin could. So I didn't have as much time to focus on myself. I was giving a lot to very young children. And so it took a little bit more time for me to kind of get up to speed, but I wanted to learn and I wanted to get healthier and I wanted to get better at listening to myself and holding myself. So I was willing and there for a while, like we had different skill levels, but we were both still interested in investing and doing our work. And now we're pretty much at the same level. I like this from therapist Katie Morton. She says, it's possible to have compassion for someone who is unable or unwilling to engage in healthier, more emotionally mature ways of existing in the world. We have to remember we can't help someone who won't help themselves. And there's a difference between someone who will help themselves, but they're stumbling along as a beginner and someone who won't help themselves. They will not do their work. There's a big difference between that. So we're looking for people who are willing to do their work and are willing to emotionally engage. That's when we're most likely to have healthy, interdependent, intimate relationships. That's the first hard truth. One person can't do all the work. The second hard truth, this was the hardest one for me, and that is it's possible that this person you're in relationship with could stay like this forever. There is no guarantee if you're in a relationship with an emotionally immature person that they will ever do their work. There is no guarantee that they will ever change and meet you in a safer, healthier space. And so that's important to remember before we go into these next steps, because you may have a parent that just never feels safe enough or powerful enough or whatever enough to fully look at their own childhood stuff, their own emotions, and do their own work. That is possible. And so when you're in a relationship with someone who is emotionally immature, the only thing you can do is some work with yourself. And so for the rest of the podcast today, that's what we're actually going to be talking about is the work we can do with ourselves. So let's say we have a parent that's emotionally immature and we want to maintain at least some sort of relationship with them. We might not ever have the relationship that we were hoping we would have. Like, you know, those deep hallmark relationships that you sometimes see where But you know what I'm talking about. We have this like ideal setup that we all have these parents that we have deep friendships with um, and that we're going to be a really close, tight-knit family. And that might not happen for us because we might not have parents that are able to open up and be vulnerable enough 
and accountable enough and empathic enough for us to connect in that way. So the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out what we want from our relationship with this person. And I want you to be as honest as possible. What I mean is like figuring out like, what do I feel like a relationship with a mom should look like? What do I need from a mom relationship? Maybe some of those things might be like, I want someone who's deeply interested in my kids and interacts with them, remembers their birthdays. I want someone that I could call up and just like tell them about something funny that happened during the day. I want someone who's interested in the things that are going on in my life, like knows like what I'm aspiring to and wants good things for me. Um, I'd love to have somebody that I can you know, watch funny movies with or whatever it is. What is it that you're wanting? What do you crave? Like, what is it that's inside of you that you're like, I just wish I had this? What is that? And I want you to be as honest as you possibly can be with yourself. This is hard because you may have grown up in a family where the way that you protected yourself was just not having any needs. And so... Admitting to yourself what you actually need may be really, really difficult. So get really clear with yourself. What do I want? What do I need from a relationship with this person? We're not worried about whether they can meet their these needs right now at all. We're just, what is it that I crave? Write it down. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to figure out what this person is realistically able to give you. Not what you feel like they should give you if they were emotionally healthier, but like at this moment in time and historically what they've shown you, what can they actually give you? So maybe you wish you had a parent that, you know, called you regularly just to like talk about things. You don't get that, but you do have a parent that like sends you a birthday card. Maybe you wish you had a family that went on vacations together and everybody got together and laughed and had fun and toasted s'mores and, you know, was active and went hiking and, you know, made all these memories or traveled together. But you have homebody parents that don't want to go anywhere. Or you have a family that when you get together, people fight over who's going to make the mashed potatoes. And there's all kinds of resentment about what that means about their skill set in the kitchen. So what can this person realistically give you? What have they shown you that they're able to give? And again, be as honest as possible and as realistic as possible. Sometimes those shoulds or those fantasies about what they could be if they would just get emotionally healthier come out in this step. The third thing is to mind the gap. What is the gap between what you need and what they can give? So where is the shortfall? Where is it not meeting up? What are the things that you still need because you still need them? I know you may have spent your childhood pretending like you didn't need these things or trying to convince yourself that, you know, you're just dramatic or you're just needy or um, you can survive without these things, but you're growing resentment and you're growing this feeling of hopelessness or like it's affecting you. You have these needs and those are valid. What needs can your parent or your loved one meet? And what needs are they not meeting? They haven't met them in the past. They're not meeting them now. They probably won't meet them in the future because they might not change. They might be like this forever. And here's the big part. What are other ways and other relationships that might help you meet those needs? Because remember, your needs are valid. Just because someone we love doesn't have the capability of meeting our need doesn't make the need go away. Now, this next step is important. Number four is to give ourselves permission and time to grieve the loss of the relationship we want and work to accept the relationship they're able to give us. This is going to take some time. But we may find that there's something inside of the relationship that they're able to give us that's a, that's okay or that we kind of like. But there's going to be things like that gap 
may be something that we have to grieve. We may never have the family that gets together and laughs and plays games and, you know, cooks these fancy dinners together. We may never have that. What do we have? What do we like? And it may be very, very small, the things that we have that we like, but we can be like, okay, they give us this and this and this. These are the ways we have some intimacy in our relationship. And these other things are things that I'm going to have to grieve that I can't have with this person and then look for other ways to meet these needs. The next thing we can do is set healthy emotional boundaries. Now, I want I want to really emphasize that this is your choice. You are not forced to play by these rules. You're hearing me talk about empathy, compassion, and how to keep someone in your life. But I want you to remember this is only if you want to keep this person in your life and you want to keep your sanity. If there's someone in your life that you're like, I just can't handle this right now. It feels unhealthy for me to be around you. Then listen to yourself and take space. That is okay. That is an absolutely acceptable thing to do. But I talk to so many clients that are like, how can I be around my dad or how can I be around my mom and know that we're not going to be close? How can I deal with some of the like passive aggressive things they say and the hurtful things they say? How do I deal with that? How do I like work with my expectations and protect myself, but still have a relationship with them? Because I don't, I'm not ready to cut them out and I don't want to. I don't know if I ever will. And so, I don't want you to feel like the options are just between like playing nice or cutting them out. There's a whole wealth of options in the middle. And we're just going to talk about a couple of them today. So feel free to brainstorm with yourself. Your inner wisdom is going to have all kinds of problem solving solutions that will work specifically for you. So one of the options you can have is to keep it casual and surfacey with this parent. Let's say that you have a parent that gets super triggered anytime you talk about your career, your spouse, your religious preferences, whatever, politics. Maybe you choose to talk about your garden. I have people in my life, I talk about my garden. I talk about their work. I talk about my kids. I talk about our travels. Like we keep it super, super surfacey. The movies that we've watched new music I'm listening to, and we avoid all those deep topics. The consequence of that is like we're connected. They know about me and I know about them. It's We're kind of like pen pals, face-to-face pen pals sometimes. I know about them. They know about me. We feel connected. We've preserved a relationship, but I had to grieve the fact that this person will never know me deeply. I will never be able to share deep parts of myself with this person. I'm never going to feel really intimately connected with this person because right now they can't handle it. They just don't want to hear about some of these other parts of my life. They don't want to hear about my work. They don't want to hear about my feelings about our shared religious history. They don't want to hear about my political views Um, we can't have civil conversations about those things because it feels very fragile and threatening. And so we don't talk about anything related to that. And honestly, with my work being in adverse religious experiences, religious trauma, deconstruction, and adverse familial experiences in childhood, like because that's my work, it also means that there's a lot we can't talk about because that touches on so much of my life. Like that's kind of woven through a lot of my life. So we keep it really simple. Well, I've, I've started growing plants specifically. So I have something to talk about with this person. I bring them plants. We talk about new, um, you know, new plants that we've put in our home and our garden, like gardening tips. And I have learned a lot from this person and it's grown its own kind of special bond, but it is not. Uh, a deeply emotional bond. It's a very functional bond. And I have warm, sweet feelings towards this person. But it's not like, it's not one of those relationships where I can fully 
be myself and they probably don't feel like they can fully be themselves either. And that's okay. We've chosen that, or at least I've chosen that in order to protect myself emotionally. So we're still connected. We haven't canceled each other, but we just have curated the discussions that we have and we keep it very surfacey. And it's pleasant. It's just not deeply intimate. Okay, so that is one choice. The other one is you can develop healthy emotional detachment. And I use this one more in like bigger group settings because there are some people that will sometimes come to big group settings that you don't want to be left out of. So maybe family reunions or weddings or birthday celebrations. Maybe there are holidays that you want to go to and there will be people there that maybe you don't want to preserve an individual connection with, but they're part of the group connection and you have to learn how to deal with them. And so during these settings, I use something that one of my coaches taught me a couple of years ago, and I create kind of an emotional protective shield around myself. So I imagine myself sort of constructing this like energetic bubble around myself that all the negativity and passive aggressiveness sort of like bounces off of or slides off of. Um, I've heard somebody else call it emotional Teflon. And I like that idea too. So it's a nonstick surface, all the negativity, the judgments, the um, projections, the, all of that. It just, it doesn't stick. It hits the nonstick surface and it slides off. And so before I go into these situations, I will imagine myself creating this sort of yellow light bubble around myself. And whenever something passive aggressive or negative um, is thrown at me, I just let like I imagine it hitting that yellow surface and just sliding off onto the floor. Um, This does take some emotional awareness. So you'll be practicing your emotional awareness exercises, the body scanning And when I notice myself like maybe weakening because I'm either getting tired or hungry or just it's been a lot thrown at me all at once, I will do self-care and I'll actually exit the the gathering. I'll go someplace like to my car or something like that. I'll deep breathe. I'll center myself and then re-engage that yellow bubble of protective energy and light. Remind myself that while I'm here, I am mine. And I don't have to internalize anything that's thrown at me. You can do that if you want. Like you just sit with yourself and you imagine this like protective bubble around you. Um, And if you feel yourself like starting to get overwhelmed or feeling a little bit fragile yourself, you take a break, you care for yourself and come back if you're able. And it's okay if you can't come back. There have been times that I've been like, okay, a break in the car isn't going to be enough. I'm going to head and take myself to lunch for a little bit. Like I'm going to go on a drive. I'm going to get away. I'm going to go for a walk. It's time for my exercise. So it's okay to do that. Okay. The next thing you can do is you can set boundaries around the frequency or length of time you spend around them. So you can engage less and less to protect your emotional energy and you can engage only when you have to. You may have family members that you're like, you know what? I will only see you at this holiday, or I will only see you at weddings and funerals, or, you know, we can meet, but we don't meet on your turf. We meet in a restaurant or we only text. That is something one of my clients is using with one of their family members that have been very volatile is they only text. So right now it's only written conversation that gives my client time to process before they respond. So They're learning how to hold their emotions, release things that are not serving them, like really take in the things that have been productive and then respond to those. So that's something you can do as well. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. There are a host of things you can do to protect yourself, but remain at least somewhat connected to people in your life who are emotionally immature if that's what you want to do. And if you don't want to, if it just feels like it is more than you're able to bear, if it feels unhealthy for you, if it feels toxic for you, you're allowed to do whatever you need to do to protect yourself. That is okay. And then last, 
please consider if you're in this situation, joining some sort of a support group, even if it's like a small one with just a couple of other people who are in you know similar situations, because what will happen is you're going to get that support where you feel like, you know, you're not alone. You're not doing this all by yourself. And they'll also be able to help you practice those tools that we were talking about where you can cope with parents that have narcissistic tendencies, addiction, even religious addiction, and other behavioral health problems. So it's really important to have that support. Okay, so as we wrap up, our small step forward today is I want you to figure out what you want from your loved one and what they can realistically offer you. Do those first two steps. What do you want? And what can they realistically offer you? And just this small step will help you see your situation more clearly. And it's going to help you really look at your expectations, which is probably where a lot of your disappointment and your anger and frustration and resentment is coming from. And it's going to help you figure out what you want to do going forward. It's a really powerful step. So really take it seriously. Give yourself time, even a couple of days if you need to, to write down what you really want from this relationship and what they're really able to give you. And it'll help you decide, like, do I need more permanent space? Do I need to break up? Do I need to limit my time with this person? Do I need to put up an emotionally energetic shield? Do I need to just keep things surfacey? What do I need knowing what they're able to offer? And remember, you are allowed to do whatever feels most supportive to you. There is no right way to move forward in emotionally immature relationships. There's a full spectrum of options that are available to you, and it is more about what feels healthiest for you. And you can always change your mind later. You can take a break from the relationship for a time, and then once you feel healthier and you feel like you have more tools, you can try again. That is an option. You are always allowed to do what feels best for you now and then change your mind later on. You're allowed to say, you know what? I just need a break. Like I'm trying to heal codependency and it's hard to heal codependency when I'm having several interactions with my family who has big patterns of codependency, you know, multiple times a week. I need a break. I need, you know, I need a month off. I need six months off. I need a year off. And can I just say this? I find that most of us have some attachment wounds, especially because we were raised by emotionally immature parents, which creates attachment wounds in their kids. So most of us have attachment wounds. There is a lot to be said for communication. It is okay to communicate to people and say, hey, I love you. I need a break. And I know that's going to hurt you, but I need a break. I've got to figure myself out and I will come back, but I need some time and space. It's okay to communicate clearly your needs with love and with kindness. It is okay to do that. That is not codependent. That is just simply that that's part of emotional maturity. It is okay to communicate what you need and want with love and kindness. It's okay to do that. That is all I want to say today. I wish you all well. This is a very (laughs) difficult thing, and it's one I think many of us are dealing with. It's going to take a lot of practice. We're going to mess it up. That's okay. As we're working with our own tools and becoming more skilled with them, We're going to mess it up. We're going to say and do the wrong thing. Sometimes we're going to be triggered. We're going to revert. We're going to have to take breaks. We're going to come back and try again. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay to be human. It's okay to be messy. It's okay to try and try and try again and keep figuring out what works. So I wish you all the best. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for being patient with me last week with the technical snafus. Come see us at Mormon Palooza in Salt Lake City. October 1st, I'm going to be doing a 50-minute hands-on workshop on inner child healing. So if emotional immaturity is something that you feel like you're struggling with or you feel like you want to have a better relationship with yourself so that you can be in healthier relationships with others, please come on over. It's going to be a wonderful class. Also, there's classes by Lindsay Hansen Park, 
from the Year of Polygamy podcast. If you're ex-Mormon, you'll know who she is. You're probably a fangirl like me. There's another class, um, the podcasters, Sarah, I'm trying to remember her last name, from Mormons on Mushrooms. They're going to be there doing a class. There's going to be all kinds of entertainment and a dance and like all kinds of fun stuff. So get your tickets and come see us October 1st in Salt Lake City at Mormon Palooza. I cannot wait. Like we're really excited. Our hotel's booked. And um, yeah, and I'll see you next Sunday.